to Patient Etiquette, How to Manage Your Bladder Cancer Treatment. My name is Patricia Rios, and I will be your moderator for today's Patients Insight webinar. This educational program is brought to you by the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network. Our guest presenter today is Becky Hannigan. Becky is a mother, patriot, and an outstanding nurse. She received her nursing degree from Houston Community College, a master's and postgrad from Walden University, and a postgrad at Texas Tech, Tech University. Becky is certified as a cardiovascular and critical care nurse. Currently, Becky is the urology oncology clinical lead at Baylor College of Medicine, working very closely with Dr. Seth Lerner for the past five years. She is joining us today from Houston, Texas to talk about our rights and responsibilities as patients. Bladder cancer often requires a long-term relationship with your healthcare team. As a patient or even caregiver, we have the responsibility to ensure our healthcare team has our support in helping to provide us care. Becky is going to explain exactly what that looks like and provide tips on how to avoid pitfalls and potholes on this journey. Without further ado, I will now ask you to direct your attention to Becky. Becky, the screen is all yours. I'm so happy everybody is here. I'm really, really excited about this because there's a lot of things that um, I'm going to cover today that's going to be really helpful uh, for everybody uh, navigating through this, um, this journey. And it is quite a journey. I have some interesting information that uh, I'm going to share with you guys. But um, uh, if we'll go to the next slide. So basically, um, the nuts and bolts of things. I don't want to uh, read everything, but what I want you to do is, um, if you have um, a pad of paper and a pen, and write down your questions, and then at the end, I will um, I'll answer your questions. So this is going to be uh, a lot of information, and I hope it's going to be um, uh, kind of jog your interest in some things, and you'll have some good questions that'll help you. Uh, move forward in uh, in this bladder cancer journey. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so what we're going to talk about um, today are uh, the rights and responsibilities of patients, but more on um, on the side of uh, responsibilities. I did include um, the patient rights that comes from the American Medical Association uh, website. And um, basically, you know, you have the right to competent care and respect. You have the right to consent to your medical treatment, among other things. But what we're really going to focus on today is the, um, the responsibilities that you have uh, as a patient. And a lot of people don't really think about it, but the, you actually do have some responsibilities. Uh, some of the most important things are going to be, uh, be honest about like if you use cocaine every day, we need to know that. So you need to be very, very uh, brutally honest with your caregiver. Um, this is a, a non-judgmental uh, arena and we want to uh, be able to do the best for you. And in order to do that, we need to know about um, what uh, medications you're taking, whether they're prescribed or not prescribed, um, what diseases you have, if there are any, um, things that you may not think are that important. Just let us know everything about your history. And then the other thing is, and this, this is uh, a little difficult even for providers or let's say the nursing staff to talk about is whether you're having sex or not. This uh, comes into play specifically with certain bladder diversions with women, because if you still are sexually active, it's important that your sur surgeon um, knows this so that they can do specific types of surgery Whereas, you know, they're just not lopping everything off and there's just like a little nub of a vagina left, you know, they'll, they'll do a specific um, manner of uh, operating where they can preserve all of the, of the vaginal cavity. Um, really basic, basic etiquette things like show up, show up to your appointment. If you make an appointment, um, show up or cancel. Uh, if you really think about it, you know, these aren't people that uh, are just coming for a regular appointment. You're taking up a slot for a cancer patient, which you are, but if you're not gonna make it, you know, just be respectful and, um, and cancel that appointment so somebody else can have that appointment. 
um, working at a, um, a teaching facility. So we have a lot of residents and medical students and medical assisting students. So kind of try to be open. Um, certainly we don't want to, uh, you know, kind of impinge upon your, your privacy, but just try to be open uh, to getting care from people that are under the supervision of your surgeon. So of course the nurses that are taking care of you, you know, be open to them asking, or excuse me, answering questions uh, that, that you have. The patient portal is really important. I know, um, you know, the average cancer patient is in, you know, mid fifties, um, which you should be pretty, uh, pretty good with the internet, but then we have some uh, octogenarians and older that can really struggle with um, the, the portals. So we ask that you have a family member, um, somebody who is at your uh, facility, if you're in a nursing home, help you out, nieces, neighbors, anybody, because nowadays that really is the key way that providers are gonna be communicating with you and how you're going to communicate with the department. Um, make your own appointment. So a lot of times I've had patients say, well, you know, it's been three weeks and nobody has called me about my CISTO appointment or my CT appointment. But nobody's really probably gonna call you. Uh, so really take the reins uh, on, when it comes to your care. If your doctor says you need to have a CT scan, it's important for you to um, pay attention, get the orders. So make sure that you have a paper order in case you need to go more than one places. And we'll discuss this a little bit later when we talk about um, insurances, um, labs, CT scans, anything like that, have the paper copies of those before you leave. Um, the next thing we're gonna talk about is healthcare technology. So bladder cancer is um, quite a unique cancer in that many people survive a really long time. That means you're going to be managed for a really long time and have a lot of technology used on you. Cystoscopies frequently, uh, going to the operating room every year, maybe every couple of years, ultrasounds, CT scans. Um, God forbid we get into medications, even the simple medications like um, Ditropan for bladder spasms. You know, that could be a lifetime thing. Chemotherapy can get very, very costly. Um, vaccinations. Okay, and we're not just talking about um, uh, COVID and the flu. Actually, this year at Beacon, we had a physician talk about an actual vaccination for bladder cancer, which is very, uh, very thrilling. And of course, at, at this time, it would be very, very costly. Um, but uh, a lot of technology procedures, some of the urologists that would be taking care of you may not have the um, the skill set or the training to do some of the really high-end uh, uh, bladder diversions, for example, an Indiana pouch or a neo bladder, and you may need to go to um, a medical center with a higher level of care. That's another technology. And then of course, we have some of the really cool things like testing. We have liquid biopsies where you can urinate into a cup. There's one particularly called CX bladder and you can urinate into a cup and it can be used as a biopsy either to detect or to monitor moving forward. Some of our patients are far enough away from their cancer diagnosis that we don't do cystoscopies anymore. We just have them do this test. And if something you know weird comes up on that test, then we would bring them back in and continue to monitor via cystoscopy, but it's a really interesting um, option for some of our patients. Uh, the other thing is ctDNA, and that's uh, circulating tumor DNA. And what it does is it takes your original tumor and they uh, sequence your original tumor. And then we can test your blood down the line and see if that tumor DNA can be detected. And what that allows us to do is to um, maybe pick up on some possible um, micro tumors or 
metastasis very early before it becomes a mass or it embeds itself uh, within uh, a lymph node. So that is a really, really neat um, uh, piece of technology that we have available to help treat uh, bladder cancer. So insurance, um, I can tell you, and you'll see in a slide later that I have a, a love-hate relationship with insurance. Um, I, I love it because I, have, I do have many patients who, who don't have insurance and uh, you know, they can't get the appropriate care. And normally we would have to refer them over to our county system, which isn't um, a bad option here in Houston because it's Baylor doctors that, uh, that service that hospital. So they do get the same care at, uh, at Bentob as they do if they came to Baylor Medicine. But, um, but then insurance can, can be troublesome because uh, when you're comparing policies, you're not comparing apples to apples. Um, Aetna may be great for cancer. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield may be great for fertility. You just really never know what you're gonna get because it's very difficult to uh, anticipate what could possibly be happening to you at this exact um, time. So a couple of things that are really important when it comes to insurance is understanding what your deductible is and how that works. Um, your deductible normally has to be paid up front. So if you have um, high deductible and co-pays, the beginning of the year may be challenging to you. Uh, another thing you'll keep in mind is make sure you um, get your next cystoscopy before December 31st. So it's covered in the current year and you have about three months until you have to uh, pay for your next cystoscopy. So that's something to think about. Um, coding. So many of you may not know about coding, but that's how the whole medical world runs on codes. Your diagnosis has a code, your procedure has a code, and those codes can really determine what you end up paying. And if anybody has gotten a, um, a lab bill and you call the lab and say, I, you know, I've gotten this done a million times. I've never had to pay for it. Why all of a sudden am I paying for it? And they'll tell you, um, well, it's not coded correctly. That's what they're talking about. Whoever put that order in didn't put in uh, a code that uh, that is appropriate in order for your insurance to pay for it. That being said, um, there are some tests that you're just going to end up paying for it no matter what the code is. So that's another thing to think about. Also with insurance, when you're doing um, surgeries, when you're doing CT scans, uh, labs, your insurance may have preferred facilities. Um, keep in mind any hospital-based uh, lab or hospital-based imaging is probably going to end up costing you more out of pocket than if you go to a freestanding or a clinic or a doctor's office-based operation. And that's something that uh, never hesitate to reach out to your insurance and ask them, hey, where do you prefer me to go to get the CT scan? That's going to keep you from, let's say, going to Baylor St. Luke's Hospital and having it denied, as opposed to going to Baylor Clinic where they would approve it. And then there's a delay. I just recently had a patient uh, state uh, she saw in an, an initial urologist and they did some testing. She ended up coming to us and we did some testing and then she needed surgery. And she says, I feel like I'm being two weeks to death. So, okay, we'll get you in in two weeks. We can get your CT in two weeks. We can get you back in to see the doctor in two weeks. So you really want to stop the two weeks from happening. So knowing where your insurance wants you to go is really going to be helpful when you're getting uh, these tests done, PET scans and MRIs and ultrasounds. It's good to know uh, where they would prefer you to go. And then there's a thing called a prior authorization. 
which um, I, the word just brings chills up my spine. Um, they are very challenging to get. You end up uh, making a 45 minute phone call uh, to answer a couple, like five questions. Once you, once you get on there, it takes maybe two minutes, but you're on hold for 45 minutes. Uh, every insurance has a different place that you need to call and it never fails that uh, you're transferred from one place to another. And keep in mind, this is us doing that. It's not you guys, you don't have to worry about that, but they can be very challenging. So uh, should anything happen where the facility, the doctor or whatever tells you that you need a prior authorization, reach out to your clinical staff. And we'll talk um, a little later exactly about who you need to reach out to, but reach out to your clinic staff. Don't wait for them to um, really take action. What I really want to impress upon you guys today is this, this is your life. So I want to empower you to really take charge of your care. We're here to give you that care. And I don't know if any of you have noticed, but healthcare uh, is really struggling lately. I mean, COVID did a number to us and, and everybody's kind of having a hard time. It doesn't matter where you go, whether it's here in the, the great Texas Medical Center or it's out in you know Topeka, Kansas in a, or, or in a teeny tiny little town in Pennsylvania. It's, it's a struggle everywhere. So things are going to get missed kind of in general. Um, keep an eye on yourself. Remember that uh, facilities have hundreds and even thousands of patients that they're trying to take care of. So you need to kind of advocate for yourself or have somebody to advocate for you, like um, a neighbor or your husband or anybody who uh, is there that can, can really kind of push the buttons and call and harass if, if needs be. Okay, so Troubleshooting is one of the things that's uh, really important, and there are a number of different kinds of troubleshooting that we can do uh, in healthcare and as patients. Um, the first one would be medical. So it's really important to know who you need to reach out to for different uh, problems. Uh, chest pain, difficulty breathing, please call 911. Do not call your urologist's office. You would be amazed how many phone calls that I get, well, I'm, you know, I'm calling you because my husband's having trouble breathing, ma'am. If you don't dial 911 right now, please. This is a urology office. It's not my, we're below the diaphragm, guys. That's up above the diaphragm. So uh, anything that involves like uh, life limb or eyesight, you know, do do a 911 kind of operation. But, so, but there would be medical troubleshooting, uh, administrative troubleshooting, that would be trying to get an appointment or get an earlier appointment. If you have issues with staff, like how you've been treated, if you need to report that, there is financial troubleshooting. So of course that would have to do with bills uh, and insurance verification. And then there's other troubleshooting that are kind of more broad-based and that's knowing what resources are available to you. One of the uh, the greatest resource is, is this, this resource that we're on right now is uh, Beacon. Uh, but there are other resources out there that can help you. American Cancer Society is a fantastic resource for transportation. A lot of people don't realize um, that if you don't have a ride to your chemo appointment, American Cancer Society can provide those rides to you. There's, of course, an application process but um, they, they've been able to provide that for some of my patients that live quite far away, uh, 40, 45 minutes, they've provided rides to, to patients to come in to get their chemotherapy here in Houston. They can also provide lodging. So I'll give you an example. The, the patients that we do um, neobladders on or Indiana pouches or any kind of um, um, cystectomy, taking the bladder out, we require that if they don't live within an hour away, that they stay in town for two weeks. That can be cost prohibitive to some people. So American Cancer Society, specifically here in Houston, I know for sure they have a lodge called Hope Lodge. And um, you can get, you and your caregiver can get lodging while you're in the hospital and getting care uh, post-operatively. So that's really good. 
The other thing is a resource would be Medicaid or whatever your, uh, you know, your state health insurance is. That's a, a good resource if you do have substandard uh, insurance or you don't have any insurance. Medicaid is an option. Local organizations, churches, many places are available uh, that can give you help with at home if you need. You'd be amazed how many patients uh, go through this journey pretty much alone. Like they might have a daughter who lives in Colorado and they're here in Houston by themselves. And this is quite a thing to go through by yourself. So you might need some help. So church organizations can help you. Um, corporate assistance um, for lodging, depending on who you work for, may have different programs. I would always uh, recommend that you reach out to your organization, employee assistance programs. Baylor has a, a, a donation program where you can donate your sick time, those types of things. So don't ever um, uh, think that there aren't things out there to help you. Reach out to your clinical staff. And, um, and of course, a beacon is a, is a fantastic resource. And I'm, I'm certain that they could help you with a lot of uh, this information. So next slide, please. So basically, the, um, the solutions with uh, bladder cancer and technology. So bladder cancer is a really high-tech cancer. And the treatment alone can last two to three years. There's a new treatment uh, for bladder cancer. Uh, is called uh, Adstiladrin, and it's a, a gene therapy. And it's every three months for two years. BCG is treatment for three years. So this is going to be a very, very long-term relationship. We hope very, very long um, with technology and treatments and CT scans. I'll give you an example. Um, so when you have bladder cancer after you've had your cystectomy or uh, after you've um, been diagnosed with low-grade cancer, you're going to have a CT scan every year for a minimum of five years. After that, um, depending on whether your um, non-muscle invasive cancer was low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk, you can then transition over to ultrasounds, but still you're getting something done every year that could potentially cost you money. Generally speaking, ultrasounds are gonna be the alternate to CT scans after five years. So you're, you're in it for the long haul uh, when it comes to, to bladder cancer. And I kind of think that's a good thing. We, I like to see my patients um, that are 12 years post cystectomy just doing really, really well. It's, it's fabulous. Then you have everybody's favorite, the cystoscopy. Uh, those go every three months for quite a long time. And then you may transition to every six months and every year. Um, maybe seven to 10 years out, you may transition to not doing the cystoscopies and you'll do um, a bladder ultrasound. We can do that for a little while. Plus we have those um, liquid biopsies that we can do. Thinking about the travel that is spent coming back and forth, if you're doing BCG, that's six weekly. Well, all of them are six weekly. And then it's three weekly every three months, you're traveling back and forth. I have people coming from Louisiana routinely to get their BCG treatment. So, so much time on the road is spent and just the, just the time spent and most likely this is time spent away from your family away from your job away from your garden so there is a lot um, involved with bladder cancer now here we go oh my love-hate relationship with insurance so bladder cancer is actually has the highest lifetime treatment cost of all of the cancers and for a good thing it's because it's survivable. So we do survive it. And then because it is such a high technological uh, diagnosis. So um, talking about insurance, if something doesn't make sense to you, reach out to uh, the billing department. Don't call your clinical staff. I have so many people um, call up here complaining about their lab bill and I have to tell them, well, first of all, I'm a nurse and I don't work for the lab. So I don't know how I can help you 
Um, but reach out to the billing department. And uh, that's really, really good information to get from the very get-go of your diagnosis. When you're first in here, and we'll talk about um, having an advocate with you in, in a little bit, but have that advocate ask those questions. Um, so what's the number to the insurance department, insurance verification? Do you have a phone number to medical records to, um, to the billing department? Because these are numbers that are probably going to come up somewhere in your diagnosis when as, as you go through this. Uh, prior authorizations, we did talk about the difference between inpatient and outpatient facilities. Inpatient facilities are gonna be your hospital-based facilities and outpatient facilities are gonna be like your freestanding. Uh, there's a place here called Houston Medical Imaging that, that does a lot of the stuff um, for us because so, they can get patients in very quickly and they do their own prior authorizations, which is really good for me. Uh, once again, we talked about preferred provider. Knowing uh, what your insurance prefers is very good. That phone number is on the back of your insurance card. Just give them a call. Who would you like me to go to to get my CT scan? Now you will have doctors tell you, I really prefer you get it done here. There, there are a number of reasons. One reason might be just because it's more convenient for the doctor. Well, it is always up to you where you go. So I want to empower you to know that you do have the last say in where you get your care, whether it's with a specific doctor or with a specific lab or with a specific radiological uh, organization. And then, like I said, make sure you get your uh, the contact information. And the staff may not know it right off, but I trust you, they can get that information for you. And then there's always the profit Google. We can consult the profit Google. So we're just gonna go over really quickly about who's who in your care team. So you're going to have your surgeon. Your surgeon is also your urologist. They're the same person. Um, that's the person that's going to be coming up with your plan of care and doing your surgery and taking care of you as you um, uh, recover. Then you'll have faculty. So if you're in a teaching facility, you're going to hear, um, I need to call my faculty member. That's normally your surgeon. Your surgeon that you meet in the office at a teaching facility is most likely going to be a faculty member. Um, you'll hear the word fellow. A fellow is a, it's still a student. They're physicians who have completed their residency, their full residency, so they can go out in the world and, and be a urologist all on their own. But what they're doing is they are taking sub subspecialty training from a specific physician. For example, you're a doctor, then you become a urologist. Then you may want to become a uro-oncologist. So you would do a fellowship in uro-oncology. So that's what a fellow would be if you hear that word. Residents, uh, most people kind of understand what a resident is. Those are medical doctors who've graduated medical school, um, but they're still in training to become a surgeon or a urologist or a gynecologist, whatever their specialty is. Normally you'll see um, those doctors in the hospital. They're gonna be the ones taking care of you after the surgery is over. They will very often participate in the surgery. And that's always a question, feel free to ask. Um, if, hey, is the resident gonna be operating on me? You, you may want to know that. And um, uh, you may protest if you, if you like, um, but I can tell you, speaking from for my experience with the uh, urologists here at Baylor is we have some really top notch residents. Um, they're very, very well trained. And once again, they are medical doctors already. Uh, they're gonna see you in the hospital. So they're the, those are gonna be the people that would be rounding on you if you um, have uh, a teaching facility. And I, I feel very sorry for you because I've actually been a patient in a teaching facility and it can be insanely frustrating because a thousand people come in the room. Once again, I want to empower you to let them know, I don't want all these people in the room. And you can say that you absolutely have the right to say that because it can be uh, very overwhelming. The next thing we have the nurse. 
Uh, this is going to be your surgeon's right hand. Uh, feel free to reach out to them. Your nurses are going to be your, your good resources and understand that the good doctors have good nurses. So uh, they're, they're going to be a, uh, probably your number one touch point as far as uh, having your, your questions answered. Uh, your nurses are going to have associate's degrees. So I graduated with an associate's degree. I now have a master's degree and I'm working on my doctorate, but you can have an associate degree, a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, or a doctoral prepared nurse taking care of you. The next thing is going to be um, LVNs. You'll hear that. An LVN is basically the same as a nurse. They don't have quite as much education. They can do almost all of the same things that a registered nurse can do, but maybe a very specific couple of things. And they're limited at an associate degree. So you can't have an LVN with a master's degree in nursing unless she actually becomes a registered nurse. Um, these are very integral uh, people in our team. They do a lot, a lot of work. In my opinion, is they don't get paid enough because they work just as hard as the RNs do. The next is going to be in the clinic side, you're going to see medical assistants. Those are either certificated uh, people or they have associate's degrees. And uh, they have very, very specific training to work in the clinic. For example, they know how to work an x-ray machine, those types of things. Um, they know how to run certain labs that like nurses aren't trained how to take x-rays and do those kind of things. So the medical assistant training is very specific to um, the, the clinic operation. And then you're going to have nursing assistants, or CNAs, or sometimes they're called patient care technicians. Those are the, the people you're going to see in the hospital that will be helping you get out of bed and walking you. They might be the one taking out your IV, uh, helping you get dressed. So they're going to be assisting in the hospital uh, with some non-technical uh, type operations. Now, this is really important. So who, who are you supposed to call when you have different, different problems? It can be very challenging. We give out a handout to our patients that on the very back page, it says, if this is happening, this is who you call. If this is happening, this is who you call. So there's kind of a list that gives you a guide on um, whether you call 911, whether you go to the emergency room, whether you call the clinic, or whether you send a MyChart message. So for example, life limb or eyesight, that's 911. Please go to the emergency room. Don't try to get a hold of us until you're being taken care of in the emergency room. Uh, certainly if you are post-op, like recently post-op within two to six weeks, if you go into the emergency room, really for any reason, specifically with a bladder issue, it's important that urology is consulted. So even if you are not in the hospital where you had your surgery, it's very important that urology is consulted because not everybody is familiar with a neobladder or is familiar with the Indiana pouch. You have an Indiana pouch, your bladder is behind your belly button and you're unconscious for whatever reason and they're trying to stick a Foley up a tube that doesn't go anywhere. That can be a little bit of a problem. We always recommend that patients get, um, I was about to say life alert. I can't think of the name, medic alert, medic alert bracelets that say that they have had a urinary diversion. This is really important because um, you're not peeing. They're gonna try and get pee out of you and they're gonna stick it in the wrong hole invariably. They need to know that you have an Indiana pouch so that they can make sure your kidneys are working and draining urine, et cetera. Um, administrative issues. <clears throat> so you would call the clinic generally. Um, our clinic is pretty big, so we have administrative people. We have people specifically that make appointments. And then, of course, we have the clinical staff. Smaller doctor's offices is probably going to be the same person, the nurse. There might be a front desk person. But things like um, appointments, you want to talk to somebody in an administrative capacity. Um, the financial issues. Of course, we talked about getting the number to the billing department. Please don't reach out to clinic for that. 
um, because I have no idea what your bill is going to be, why it's so high. Uh, most of the time, I don't know what insurance you have unless I have to do a prior authorization. And that's and then I don't even know what they cover. So nurses are kind of um, separate from, from that information. We really don't know you know, what, what to expect as far as what the patient has and, and what's covered. So you need to reach out to either insurance verification or the billing department. Um, and then we talked about um, the resources, American Cancer Society, your local resources. Uh, Beacon is probably a, num a number one uh, resource for talking with other patients. A really, really good resource with talking with other patients that are going through the exact same thing as you the same sex, same age, same exact diagnosis, type of cancer, muscle invasive, non-muscle invasive, you're going to find it all here. Um, some clinics are going to offer, like our clinic, we have local patients that have consented to give out their contact information, which is really nice because um, neo bladders and females, we don't have a whole lot of. So it's nice to have somebody, uh, a, a female that we can talk to Oftentimes we'll refer to uh, to Beacon, which is a, a, a fabulous resource for that kind of information. Um, picking a team, <clears throat> I have a couple of resources on there. When you're looking, if any of you are new uh, in the in this bladder cancer journey, or you're looking for a new team for whatever reason, there are a number of different um, resources that you can reach out to. If you go to the next slide. Um, there you go. Thank you. So Castle Connolly is a fabulous resource, uh, health grades, vitals.com. They're going to have, um, these are like the more, I don't want to say fancy, but healthcare specific, uh, type grading systems. You can go to Yelp. You can go to Angie's list. There's a lot of good information there. Um, but uh, Castle Connolly uh, has a, a lot of um, very objective information as well. Uh, health grades will uh, tell you how they've been graded. Uh, Press Ganey is another way. Look at that information. And also read, read some of the responses. It was interesting. I was looking at my doctors and um, some of them are not really up to date. Like the last thing I saw in Dr. Lerner, one of them might have been Yelp. It was like 2017, which, um, you know, I kind of think that we're not in the, in the Yelp crowd, but you never know. But um, you'll see five, 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 and you see this one, and that's the one I'm going to. I'm like, one, what's going on? What did they say? And it, most of the time, it's because um, it took a long time for them uh, to see the doctor. We're very, very busy, so we do tend to have um, waits. I would ask you to consider um, when you're looking at a physician, what the wait time is. And there's kind of a, a, a Goldilocks range. You certainly don't want to be waiting three hours for a routine appointment with this physician, but um, I, I might question a doctor that can get you in really, really, or has a lot of appointments. Uh, we overbook a lot of our patients, and that's because, um, number one, we're a cancer clinic. So our patients uh, never wait more than two weeks. A new patient will never wait more than two weeks, and it doesn't matter how busy our clinic is. We're going to get you in, and you will be seen within two weeks. Um, and the, the other thing is, is we're a surgical clinic, so all of our patients that have surgery have to come in um, within two weeks for their, their post-op appointments, so very often we have to overbook. Keep in mind, you're probably going to have a wait. Um, doctor's offices, I've been um, I've been really lucky, lucky lately. I, I see the VA and, and they actually get me in pretty quickly once I get there. Um, but there's almost always going to be a wait no matter where you go. Healthcare is struggling once again with staff. Um, we don't have enough doctors. So I just ask that you try to be as patient as possible. Ask when you make the appointment. Do, is the doctor usually on time? Some of us still have jobs. So I want to be able to tell my job, I'm going to be back in two hours, or I need to take the whole day off. Some of us have to pick up our grandkids after school. 
And if I have an 11 o'clock appointment, I would assume I'm going to be out by three. But you know what? Ask. Ask how timely this doctor is. You know, do they usually run on time or how long do I anticipate waiting? That's another thing that, um, that can be really helpful. But picking your team is really, really important. Getting a referral from your doctor, a trusted referral, and then looking that doctor up and making sure that that doctor works with you. Like I said, this is a long, long-term relationship. It's going to be good if you guys can get along. Lastly, I'll say um, having a good bedside manner and being able to um, associate with your, your physician and their team on a personal level is important, but I would ask that you take their competence uh, uh, a little more highly than their personality. Dr. Lerner, I love him. Him and I are like two peas in a pod. We have the exact same personality. He is very straight to the point. He's ridiculously caring. He's going to answer your questions. But if you start talking about something other than golf, if you start talking about golf, he's going to talk to you forever. But it's something that's outside of medicine. He's going to be like, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't have time to listen to that right now. I'm going to have Becky come in and we're going to take care of this. Very often doctors will pass off questions to the nursing staff. And that's only because they trust their staff to answer your questions. Uh, so try not to um, be too offended by that. I have seen patients get upset. Um, oh, well, he just didn't have time for me. Well, yeah, because he's got 20 more cancer patients he, he needs to see. So very often um, you'll get the, um, I call it the A plus team. We're not the B team. The nursing staff comes in and, and answers your questions. But um, that's just some of my little pearls of wisdom, uh, how you can navigate uh, being a patient. Also, I'm going to ask, and this is from a, from a personal perspective, uh, keep in mind that, that we're human too, and, um, and we're standing in front of you at work, and yes, you have cancer. Uh, we do understand that, but keep in mind, you never know if somebody's dad has just died, and they're still there taking care of you, or, you know, maybe something's going on with their family member. They just kind of Understand that we are there to take care of you, but at the same time, we're human as well. So maybe give us a little bit of break if we don't have a cheesy smile on our face. Now, that's just from a per very personal perspective. Um, and next slide, and we're actually on to questions. I hope I gave you guys uh, a lot of information that's going to be helpful, and I hope it simulated questions for me. So I'm really excited to, to answer uh, any questions you guys have for me.